Childhood, it's a time to grow, to learn, to discover what the world is all about. In the brief span of years between birth and adolescence, we can witness the evolution of the child's ability to think, act, and interact. But how does it all begin? Do we each start with the same potentials? If so, why are we each so different? Peekaboo! Why is it that six-month-old Glenn sits indifferently and cannot be coaxed into a game of peekaboo? While Derek, a mere four months older, enjoys the opportunity to smile and play with his mother. Where's mommy? Peekaboo! Hi! Where's <laughs> dad? Why does 14-month-old Melissa cry when her mother leaves the room, while Sarah hardly seems to notice? I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. How is it that each of these preschoolers is unique, yet has identical misconceptions about the concrete world? Why is Sean resilient and outgoing despite a past rocky home life, while Tommy, with similar circumstances, seems to seek rejection? and usually finds it. How did it come to be that Chris and his teenage friends are headed toward productive adult lives, while 17-year-old Jennifer already has two children, no husband, and more challenges than opportunities ahead? Why are children so different? And why are they so alike? The answers lie in the complex and dynamic processes of child development. We can see many of the changes that occur in the life of the child but truly understanding how and why those changes and not others take place is another matter. Oh, wow. <laughs> Leading the way and broadening our understanding has been the field of developmental psychology. Developmental psychologists are interested in the same basic question all psychologists are interested in, which is how is it that human beings are and come to be the kind of uh, people that we are. The way scholars have looked at child development has continually changed and there's even some diversity of opinion today. But one widely accepted view is that child development consists both of what is built into the child, what the child brings, and the context that the child grows in. The traditions in developmental psychology have oversimplified either making the child passive to be filled up by others or making the environment passive with the child sim just taking things as if they exist to be plucked off of trees or as if the child can invent everything from the start. There's another view of the child that's quite different and that is the child as constructor. Instead of the child being passive, it casts the world as passive. So in the, in the view where the child is constructing it all, the child is actively involved in trying to figure everything out. 
but there's no attention given to the dynamic processes going on between the child and other people and between the child and the cultural institutions and traditions that the child is engaged in. And it's those processes that make a difference. Moreover, they make a difference depending on who the person is to begin with, whether it's male or female, young or old. But not only those, let's say, demographic characteristics, which turn out to be quite important, but also the characteristics that the person brings. The infant is born with a temperament. The infant is born with a birth weight. The infant is born uh, with various other characteristics, which then determine how the process runs. And the process will run differently depending on the setting in which it's running. And so we have this fascinating moving system which then produces us as in not only as groups but as individuals part of what every child brings to the developmental process is potentials for growth and change what's more these changes tend to build one on the other in a fairly predictable order imagine the development of skills for picking up an object a very young baby picks up an object with its fingers and thumb held together. An older baby picks the object up with the fingers and thumb opposed, but when they first do that, they're still unable to do it with any finesse or great coordination. By two and a half years of age, they pick it up, place it, drop it, all uh, with a great deal of skill. And so it goes from simple to complex. Development is the interaction of a child's biology, earlier experiences, and present circumstances in a social and cultural context. And it is the process of the mind and spirit of the child interacting with people and the surrounding world. You'll be four and five, you'll be five. Throughout the ages, there have been many ideas about growth and development, and these different beliefs about what holds true for all children have led to different ways of viewing the process of change from infancy to adulthood. Modern viewpoints on child development can be traced to the ideas of 17th century British philosopher Jean Locke and to the ideas of 18th century French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. John Locke's view was that um, the nature of human beings is determined by their experiences, that they come into the world as a blank slate and that their experiences right on that slate, that is, their experiences determine who they will be. Rousseau's view was that we are predetermined to go through a sequence of development and that environmental input is needed to support that predetermined sequence, but that any normal environment will then foster optimal development. From the ideas of Locke and Rousseau, psychologists have continued to ask the so-called nature-nurture question as they examine the course of development in more detail. At the turn of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud led the way in explaining the emotional mind of the child. Freud's psychoanalytic view was a very deterministic theory. The basic argument was that early experience somehow caused what the child would be like later. So if the infant, for example, uh, didn't have uh, sufficient gratification of their oral drives, they later on might be an alcoholic. Later theories, for example, Eric Erickson's, are less deterministic, and they view development as a series of issues, each of which is important, and each of which builds upon the other, leading to later development. Others in this century have viewed development through different prisms. English theorist John Bowlby defined social emotional development in terms of past experiences and current circumstances. American behaviorist John Watson took a view similar to Locke's, focusing on how learning and experiences influence development. 
In contrast, Yale researcher Arnold Gesell looked at children in the tradition of Rousseau and detailed their physical growth and change. In the 1920s, Swiss researcher Jean Piaget incorporated views from both Locke and Rousseau as he began to look at cognitive development, the growth of the child's mind. Jean Piaget saw a role both for experience, as we would expect from the uh, John Locke position, and a role for genetically determined developmental course, as we would um, expect from Rousseau's position. Piaget wondered why children make the mistakes they do. He wondered what was the nature of the thought process b behind each error. How the child contributes to his own cognitive development was a major theme for Piaget. The child is, is active, trying to understand, trying to uh, control what he can do and control the world around him. Another insight which perhaps wasn't unique to Piaget but played a very important role in his theory was that what you know as a four-year-old, say, uh, is critically dependent on what you knew as a three-year-old, which in turn is critically dependent on what you knew as a two-year-old and so on back. Piaget theorized major stages or periods of cognitive development. Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. Within each stage, the thinking abilities of the child are described in terms of the way they can process information, the kinds of manipulations of information they can do, and the way they can represent that information. In the sensory motor period, the infant learns about the world through her senses and physical movements. In the pre-operational period, the young child becomes able to use symbols, but has limited use of logic. In the concrete operational period, the child develops the ability to think logically, but has limited understanding of abstractions. Finally, in the formal operational period, the child develops the ability to combine and compare abstract propositions. Piaget is not the be-all and end-all in the field of cognitive development. For example, Piaget said very little about the child's adaptation to his or her environment. So a number of people are trying to create new theories that capture what was valuable out of Piaget's theory and that leave behind those parts of it that are flawed. From the research of Piaget and others with different points of view, Today's developmental psychologists continue to explore the basic nature of children, each viewing the child through a particular prism, each contributing to our ever-expanding knowledge of child development. Here are two glasses with blue liquid in it. Do mm -hmm. they have the same amount in them? Yeah. Yeah, you're really sure? Yes. Every okay, quest to is. understand children begins with an idea about the nature of children and how they develop. Once we have an idea about what it is that governs development, what separates a developmental psychologist from a uh, person with good intuitions on the street is that developmental psychologists go out to gather data to try and figure out if their idea is correct or not. Developmental researchers use a variety of methods, and most of these are common to the behavioral sciences. For example, there are experiments that can be done. Present children with one kind of circumstance, another group of children with a different kind of circumstance. Set up a task in different ways and see what's easier or harder. Ooh. Ooh. You all finished? And assuming that babies are not born knowing what an animal is or what a vehicle is or what clothing is, that they have to learn this. And so the question is when. So what we've been doing in our laboratory recently is trying to move back to younger and younger ages. And of course, the younger you go, the harder it gets because the, uh, the younger the child, the fewer responses that are at their disposal. If the three-year-old sorts 
uh, that's fine. The two-year-old doesn't sort, but the two-year-old will do the sequential touching. That's fine. The one-year-olds don't even really do sequ sequential touching. If you put out a whole bunch of animals or, I mean, a little toys in front of them, they'll just be overwhelmed and they're apt to stare at it. Or maybe they'll lean forward and pick up one, and in so doing, they'll knock everything else onto the floor. Okay. They're all sitting out on the table in front of you. Uh, you do a double take because they look alike, a lot alike. And yet all of our nine-month-olds, every one that we have tried, clearly distinguishes between the birds and the airplanes. Now there's a case where the shapes are about as close as you could possibly make it, going from one major category of things to another uh, mm -hmm. major category. So it isn't that they're doing anything with the, on the basis of shape. They're not in any sense saying these are the same kind of things because they look alike. They're telling us those are different kinds of things, yeah. even though they do That's look alike. Everything. Good job, Kayla. One of the things that we're doing here is trying to come up with a new way of assessing children's relationships with their parents that will not be biased against children whose mothers are in the workforce. The child plays with some toys and is having a jolly good time with the toys, and then the mother takes the toys away and puts them inside a plexiglass box and locks the box so that the child isn't able to open it but can still see these toys. Our effort with this task is to see whether this child will be able to negotiate with his mother to get the box opened. And so we're able to see whether children are as likely to use their mothers as a resource to get what it is that they want. The reason that we're using this plexiglass box is that we think that children who actually have been rejected by their mothers will be less likely to go to them to try and get help. So this is a way that children whose mothers are working or not working would be exactly comparable in this situation. Fish, seaweed. The fish thought the seaweed was another fish. Good. We measure how much effort, how much mental effort or thinking effort is involved uh, by how much interference or how much finger tapping slows down. We've been doing this by asking the children to make up sentences for pairs of words. And on some trials, or sometimes, we ask the child to engage in a secondary task. The secondary task is finger tapping. And we ask them to tap as quickly as they can. Athlete, toothbrush. The athlete, um, ha, um, brush, brush with his toothbrush. Very good. Oh, girl, look at that, girl. Ooh, look at those things. It's tricky just to get good electrophysiological recordings from young children because they're always moving around, moving their eyes and their muscles. We've worked very hard over the past five years to develop the methods to enable us to do this. And using these techniques, we've sort of uh, studied the changes in brain organization that occur as children go through different um, levels of skill in the language acquisition process. There's Donald Duck. <gasps> Yeah, there's a doggy. Baby. Glasses. Toothbrush. We've observed that, uh, mm. most generally speaking, w yeah. what happens over time mm. is that we see an increasing TV. specialization of the brain systems yeah. that mediate mm. language. Those are experiments. Also, you can do naturalistic observation observe children, much as a biologist does observing any species. Or, with children, since they're human beings, you can interview them, ask them questions. One for me, one for you, one for me, one for Amy. I study children in the home 
where they really learn how to talk. They don't learn how to talk in the laboratory at the university. So we want to look at them in the natural surroundings. So what I'm really interested in is the kind of information that caregivers, and that can be mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, anybody who is really with the children, the kind of information that they give children to convey information about the culture to them so that they learn about the world. And that includes language. That's a zebra. Zebra. Yeah. Oh, that is. Do you know what that is? Bear. That's a panda bear. That's right. What's that? No, no animal. There. That's a that's a blank one, right? Which one are you gonna use? Oh, Amy has the dice. Seven, eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, seven. Yep, just counting them. Michelle, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you how smart you are, okay. okay? Okay. Pretend that these are all the children in your class. This is the smartest child, this is the next smartest, this is the next smartest, and this child way down here isn't smart. Okay. Could you tell me which child are you? How smart are top you? One. Okay. You're the you're the top one? Top one. You're the second one. Mm -hmm. How do you know that you're the second smartest in your class? Because I'm not that smart. Because you're not that smart? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have been interested in children's criteria for judging their competencies. The younger children tend to give us a response that we code as mastery-oriented. They, they tell us something that they can do. What else do you know about? Mm. Bees. You know about bees? Mm -hmm. And what else do you know about? Ants. And ants? Mm -hmm. Does that show that you're the smartest in the class? Yeah. Yeah? Here's the story. Judy was a 13-year-old girl. Her mother promised her that she could go to a special rock concert coming to their town if she earned the money to buy a ticket. Judy managed to save up the money the ticket cost, but then her mother changed her mind and told Judy that she had to spend her money on new clothes for school. Judy was disappointed, and she decided to go to the concert anyway. She bought the ticket, and told her mother that she hadn't saved enough money for new clothes, only a couple of dollars. So that Saturday, she went to the concert, but told her mother that she was at a friend's house. Her mother never found out what she did. Now, I'm wondering, Tim, what you think the problem in this story is. Um, well, I think the problem was that um, Judy's mom decided not to let her go after she saved up the money. Why do you think that's a problem? because um, Judy's mother broke her promise. A lot of times we're just walking back from break and she'll like provoke her friends to try and make fun of me and stuff uh -huh. when I haven't done anything. One of the things that we're looking for, particularly as children near the, the middle or the end of elementary that. school, we're looking to see if they can um, characterize or give behavioral descriptions of, of their peers so that not only do we know whether they like them or not, but we begin to understand why they like them and they begin to be able to articulate why they like them. Okay. Is there anyone in your class that really doesn't have a best friend? Um, no, not really. So everybody has a best friend? Yeah. And do they keep the same best friend all the way through the year? Um, yeah, usually. I mean, only once or twice in my class someone's broken up with their friend, but they still sort of hang out with each other, just they don't like each other as much as they did. Does everyone in the class know when that happens? Yeah, because they sort of, they talk, fight out loud and stuff, sort of, uh -huh. and they use other people as targets. There's also one method that's unique in developmental psychology. That's the longitudinal investigation. This method allows you to answer some kinds of questions that you really can't answer any other way. One kind of question has to do with the course or nature of development. For example, is development steady and gradual or are there periods of rapid change? 
You can't answer that question looking at groups of children at different ages. You have to follow individual children over time to see that. The longitudinal study carried out at UCLA by Arthur Parmalee um, and other investigators and myself showed that there were re relationships between the kinds of sleep characteristics the babies showed and later development from birth to age 12. And those babies who showed more quiet sleep did tend to be more competent later in life. Infants who um, showed a great deal of indeterminate sleep, sleep that could not be classified, were less competent. And they were less competent at every age in which we measure them, up to age 12. There are a number of difficulties in, in, in conducting longitudinal studies. One of the major difficulties, of course, is trying to uh, maintain the sample. It's very, the sample, the group of children who you are studying become more and more valuable to you the longer that you continue the study. Um, one does not want to lose many subjects in a longitudinal study because it becomes m meaningless if you cannot follow the children over time. There's a whole second set of questions that have to be approached with a longitudinal study. And that has to do with how do individual children become the people they are. The ways of studying children are many. Through such methods as observation, correlational studies, clinical interviews, and experiments, we're finding the answers to the riddles of childhood. And every answer seems to raise more questions. Questions about how development is influenced by the interaction of biology and environment. How past experiences and past development affect the present. Questions about the basic nature of children and the wondrous process of child development.